All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. We'll start to let others trickle in from the waiting room. Happy Pride Month um, to you all. I'll go ahead and introduce myself uh, since I am probably a new face to many. Uh, my name is Kelly Talby. I'm communications and uh, development coordinator for Kentucky Voices for Help and a member of the Thrive Kentucky Partnership and campaign, and I'll be sitting in for Miss Emily today. Um, each month, as you all know, we try to continue focusing on uh, changes in policy and regulation, both at the state and federal levels, uh, just so that you can have an idea of what's changed in the past few weeks, but also maybe what to anticipate over the um, both short-term and long-term outlooks. Uh, these monthly programs are designed to bring you the latest, not just in those state and federal responses to COVID-19, um, but other updates uh, within the safety net programs and any opportunities to educate, advocate, get even more involved than you already are within your respective communities. Um, so we'll get going here. Some of you are familiar with Thrive Kentucky. Uh, but as a refresher and for any uh, new faces in the crowd today, our core principles and purpose are built on meeting every Kentuckian um, where they are uh, through getting their basic needs with systemic change and what we've got. Uh, when you get a copy of these slides tomorrow and our follow-up resources, you can go through our shared principles a little more in depth. Um, here is a snapshot of our steering committee members um, and where to reach them. Um, as you all may have recently heard, we are tremendously grateful for our 2021 sponsors. Uh, they help us bring these formats to you for free uh, for our licensed social workers and certified community health workers. They allow us to offer you continuing education credits for free. Uh, so we do um, appreciate them and the engagement and commitment they have made for our 2021 webinar series. So here's a quick snapshot of the agenda for today um, and what you all have been seeing on social lately. Um, each of our Thrive Kentucky partners will, of course, cover their area of expertise as we go. And just a few housekeeping items. Um, it is a crowded room. More folks will continue to join us um, as the program goes on. So try to keep your line muted. Um, we are recording this. And so after um, the program today, it'll be loaded onto YouTube. It will be included in your materials you receive tomorrow as a follow-up resource. And that way at any time you can go back and listen to what anyone said in particular. Um, as speakers are presenting, we encourage you to um, submit your comments or questions in the chat box. Um, we try to, we find it easiest and best to try to respond to those in live time so that um, everyone can see the responses if you have a good question. So please do not be bashful or shy or worried at all about using the chat box. We encourage it. Uh, for our CHWs and licensed social workers, um, I will drop my email in the chat and it will be on a later slide. Um, please just follow up with me after today's program and I'll coordinate getting a certificate for you for continuing education credit. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sheila Schuster, who's going to be giving us a 2021 legislative interim preview. Um, it feels like the regular session for 2021 just ended but believe it or not, it is time to prepare for the 2022 legislative session. Uh, so Dr. Schuster, I will kick it over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that introduction. And if you would go to the next slide, please. Uh, Kelly's right. It feels like we just got out of uh, the general assembly session. And some of you may already know that the legislature typically has what we call an interim uh, general assembly session. It runs between the regular session of one year and prepares for the regular session of the next year. So it typically runs between June 1st and December 1st, although sometimes the committees get special permission to meet 
into the month of December. It's not un unusual for them to have a first week or second week of December meeting as well. So one of the things that you'll see is that the House and Senate committees that deal with the same topics will meet jointly and they will meet once a month. So we follow uh, obviously the Health and Family Services uh, Committee in the House and the Health and Welfare Committee in the Senate. So those two committees will meet jointly and they're called the Interim Joint Committee on Health and Welfare and Family Services. So there will also be an Interim Joint Committee on Appropriations and Revenue and on Licensing and Occupations and on Banking and Insurance and so forth. So it's a long title, but what it means is that you've got all of your House members and all of your Senate members. And the other thing that's interesting is that the uh, chair uh, those really co-chairs of these interim joint committees. And so they switch back and forth usually each month. So one month the House uh, committee chair will chair the meeting and the next month the Senate committee chair will chair the meeting. So you might ask, well, why, why do they do that? And it's interesting because they can't actually take formal action on bills. Uh, they can take votes to approve minutes and to make recommendations. But since the House and Senate are not formally in session until the first week of January 2022, or if we have a special session, they cannot take actual, uh, actually take formal action on any bills. What's important about it, though, is that they will look at many uh, issues, and we'll talk about that in, in the next slide. But the schedule of meetings varies from month to month. So instead of always being Tuesdays at 10, uh, the interim committee schedule is a little bit strange and wonky. So we've given you the link there and later on we'll show you what the June um, committee schedule looks like. So Kelly, if you would go on to the next, please. So here's your June committee meeting and you see it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, very few. They used to have some meetings on Fridays, but apparently this year they're not going to. So you'll see the, uh, it'll just say education or transportation. Remember that's the House and the Senate members of education meeting, judiciary. Um, and then you'll see in italics, um, what we call our special committees or special task forces. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. So this is available on the website or when you get our slides tomorrow, you'll have a copy of the June um, committee meetings. And when we do our July update, forum, we will have the July page for you as well. All of the uh, committee meetings and task force meetings will be available either on KET or live stream to, from the Legislative uh, Research Commission. And again, we've given you that link. So the next one, please, Kelly. So what are they going to talk about? Well, it used to be in the olden days, and I've been doing this for a long, long time, so I remember those olden days. Uh, the interim was used only to talk about bills that did not pass in the previous session. And it has expanded greatly since then. Now they talk about bills that did not pass that are likely to come back in the next session. But they also talk about new issues that have emerged. So it's a great time for you to introduce to the legislators um, a new concept that you might have particularly if you are hoping to introduce legislation about it in 2022. In fact, some of the committee chairs, and I note particularly Senator Schickel, who is chair of the um, Senate Licensing and Occupations Committee, has a rule that if their um, interim committee is not heard, particularly a new issue, he typically will not let that bill come to his committee for action in the regular session because the regular session, as you may recall, is very hurried, too hurried, we think. And sometimes there's not enough time to fully vet an issue. So he likes to have these issues presented during the interim when there's more time and more opportunity for both House and Senate members to really discuss the issue, kind of debate it, ask questions and, and so forth. The other thing that's uh, different about the interim session is that we have special task forces and these have been appointed by the legislative leaders and will meet during the interim session. Most of these were recommended in bills that either passed or were considered during the recent session. 
So some of those, for instance, there's one on services for persons with severe mental illness. That's a task force, a concurrent resolution that's passed the House the last two sessions, but not the Senate. There's also one on Medicaid waivers. We call them the 1915C waivers for people with severe disabilities. There's one on funding for kindergarten through 12th grade public schools. Uh, there's a special commission on racial impacts and opportunities. Uh, there's one on um, county clerks. Uh, there's a big issue around uh, whether paramutual racetracks will pay a higher tax for the betting that goes on at racetracks. And there's also one on unemployment insurance, which many of you on this call may be particularly interested in. So those are also listed on your monthly calendar and uh, you should have access to those uh, remotely. And again, the link is there for you to look at those committees. They have House and Senate co-chairs. They have majority and minority leadership. Most of those do not have any members except for legislators. Um, so it'll be a, a legislator only kind of task force. And our next slide, Kelly, please. So <laughs> the access is gonna be the same as it was during the regular session, which to my way of thinking was uh, limited, very remote, very limited. But you can check the legislative website, and you know that uh, website by now, www.legislature.ky.gov. Um, if you go to the committee's uh, link, which we gave you on the previous slide, it will have the agenda, it will have um, PowerPoints and other materials that you can get access to. If you remember during the regular session, you could go to um, the uh, web page, the front page, and you could look either on KET or on the legislature's own live stream to follow the uh, meetings. And most of those meetings then are archived. So if you miss them, they're usually posted 24 to 48 hours later and you could go back and see them. Um, the legislative message line will be in operation. Uh, probably those hours are eight to five, pretty traditional hours during the interim. And you remember that number is 1-800-372-7181. Uh, if you're not registered with the switchboard, it takes about 30 seconds, a minute maybe to get registered. And then from then on, you could just give them your name and your telephone number and they'll pull it up. They will ask you who you want your message to go to and what, what your message is. Uh, for those with uh, needing hearing assistance, there's a Kentucky Relay at 711. The legislators' offices can also be reached by dialing 502-564-8100, and you'll get a receptionist. But very often, particularly if you're a constituent, be sure to identify yourself as a constituent if you are a constituent of the legislator you're trying to reach. They will take a message and really try to track down the legislator for you. If you want to send an email, you remember that it's first name dot last name at lrc.ky.gov. The exact um, email addresses are on the LRC website as well. Sometimes it's hard to know whether people are using, for instance, Daniel or Dan or Danny. So it's important to get that right uh, when you're sending an email. And I would also remind you that legislators are not going to be in Frankfurt on a daily basis. They may be up there maybe two or three days a month, depending on how many committees or task forces they're on. So don't hesitate to, count, to contact them at home, not at midnight and not when you're mad as heck at them, but, um, you know, politely and persistently. And that information can also be found on the LRC website. So we will keep you updated in um, future forums about the nature of the task forces and what kinds of issues are going to be heard by the various interim committees. So at this point, I will turn it over, I think, to uh, Dustin. Oh, I'm sorry. It's how okay. Can I, how could I miss that? Dustin. That's all right. <laughs> to my uh, buddy, Kara Stewart. Thank you, Kara. Uh, yeah, hi, Kara Stewart of Kentucky Voices for Health, um, and I also have dogs in my home, but they are mostly older, and so I don't know that they'll be joining into the chorus. Dr. Schuster, I think we should all get to see um, that whatever that puppy is at your house. 
that should be a part of the Thrive webinar going forward. Thanks. So um, I am here to talk about what we know with ARPA and the child tax credits and what's going on forward in DC. Um, um, this is just sort of a basic reference slide from KY policy about all of the numbers and all of the money. Here's what we gotta remember. The American Rescue Plan Act is a lot of dollars coming to Kentucky this year, a lot. Like big, lots of commas, lots of zeros. We gotta all be a part of figuring out how it is spent in ways that is useful, best useful to those who need it most. You know, the next slide. This is what's been appropriated so far. There's still a lot to go. So there's still a lot of room for people to be engaged and make asks of where that money goes. And then the next slide. This is if you have not gotten, or if you know of anyone who's not gotten their relief money, um, that the additional check, most people have gotten theirs, but if you have not, it's worth filing your taxes and check the status of your relief check at that. When you get this in your email, that's a lot of link. Next one. All right, so this is the, the big deal update. So the qualifying families will start getting checks next month in July. Um, now, the, there's going to be two portals set up by the IRS, which they say will be set up by one month from today. So July 1st, if this, this update next month, we should have those portals because they're supposed to be set up by July 1st. So you haven't missed anything yet. They don't exist yet. Um, right now, we just know that they're going to be created. Um, but that most families, most Kentucky families, will just, without doing anything at all, get their check in the mail um, for the child tax credit that's going to be coming out um, by July 15th. So most folks will need to do anything at all, but if people want to make adjustments, there's going to be those two portals that aren't created yet. So just know that you haven't missed anything yet. That's the big news there. And then what else is happening? What else is going on in Washington, D.C.? There are two other bills. Big packages, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. Um, and that's, we don't know, we don't have like a specific date for what's happening there, but they are big, um, big businesses that can do, will do a whole lot um, of good. So we're looking at ways to reach out and say, yes, please support these two bills. They're full of lots of things that will help Kentucky families. They will make pieces of the ARPA permanent. Um, and especially the child care subsidies, as you can see in there, um, making that a permanent increase. And that's what obviously we know families need. So families need support taking care of children so that parents can go to work. And we know which Dustin's going to talk to you some more about um, economic impact things. But we know that women are the people who have been cut out of the workforce and are not going back to the workforce. And a great way to support women getting back into the workforce is supporting child care. Because it turns out that's why a lot of women don't go back to work right now. Um, so this is what we're looking forward to. There's, there's not like a, um, again, there's like a date certain for votes on either. So we're just sort of hanging in the balance and we'll keep you updated as we go. Um, but big bills out there to bring a lot of infrastructure support and money to Kentucky. And I think that now the real Dustin Pugel um, will talk to you. Uh, my my puppy is also downstairs, um, so Dr. Schuster, I hope yours is okay. I'm sorry if you could hear her uh, whining at me. Apologize for that. So, sounded like she was just uh, backing you up. Uh, so uh, she was, uh, yes, she just wanted to be annoying. She was not in any pain. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so just one quick. Uh, note on the American Jobs and Families Plans. Um, I think, you know, folks have heard about the price tag that has gone along with those um, in, you know, in recent weeks, I guess, at this point, not months. Um, I just wanted to point out that while it is a big price tag, unlike the American Rescue Plan, these plans are meant to be spent over the course of eight years. Um, so it really is supposed to be mu much more of a sustaining long-term um, support for both infrastructure, physical, and care, um, and also for families in, in different regards. So they really would be transformational plans, and they would be they would be so for the long haul, not not for just this year, which uh, I think is really needed and really important. Um, so in shifting to our economic overview, um, just again, my name is Dustin Pugel. I'm the senior policy analyst with the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy. 
Um, for folks who aren't familiar, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit research organization who focuses on state-based policy uh, in, in many regards, but really uh, aimed at trying to improve the lives of low and moderate income Kentuckians. So um, today I, I really want to sort of give some, some overview of where things stand with jobs right now, but I also want to address um, a narrative that I think has really proliferated recently around um, what folks are calling the job shortage or the labor shortage. Um, I, and I think there are some ways in which um, that is a useful thing to talk about. And there are a lot of ways in which I think um, there's a, there are misnomers. So I wanna try and dive into some of that today. Um, but just in starting out, you know, I start with this slide every time uh, so folks can kind of see where we are. Uh, uh, this is sort of a zoomed in version of our, our overall jobs pictures according to um, the employer survey. Right now we have, um, you know, right around uh, 1, 1.8, 1.9 million um, jobs in the state, uh, which is still about 98,000 fewer jobs than we had in February of 2020, which was the month before the pandemic hit. So that's a lot of folks out of work um, at the moment. Uh, we've bounced back about two thirds of the way uh, to where we were before, but we're still, you know, a full 5% below um, where we started. So there was an initial really impressive uh, bump in jobs as a lot of folks who were temporarily laid off got to return to their jobs by around this time last year, actually. Um, but since that time, things have sort of stalled out. And, and there are a lot of different reasons for that in terms of our net job growth that, that we'll get into. But just suffice to say that, that right now we are in a, we're in a position where um, a lot of folks are still in a lot of need um, for assistance. There are uh, really impressive surveys that go out on a regular basis that show that one in three adults are still having difficulty meeting usual household expenses. Uh, one in four parents report having difficulty with um, providing their kids enough food. There are still one in three Kentucky renters who are concerned about being evicted. So we are not out of this yet, even though the recovery has begun in earnest there is still a considerable amount of need that exists in the Commonwealth. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So um, specifically within the labor market, um, I think folks have seen and have heard a lot about a job shortage specifically in restaurants. Um, and I, uh, there is a degree to which that is true. I think one of the ways that economists look to see if there, if there really is a labor shortage is to see what's happening with both hiring and wages. So if there are a lot of openings, but, but hiring is slowed down and uh, there is a, a, a temporary or, or long sustained increase in wages in that sector, that usually signifies that there, is, um, uh, there, there, there are more openings than available workers for those openings. Um, and from what national economists are saying, you know, that there is a degree to which that's true in the, in the um, uh, what's called the accommodation and food services sector, which is, um, you know, restaurants essentially and, and some others as well. So um, while that is true, while there is the validity to that, it's also true that accommodation and food services um, as a sector have really outpaced every other industry uh, in terms of its hiring in, in, in April specifically. Um, but also has moved along at a really good clip since the beginning of the year. Um, and that, uh, unsurprisingly, there has been a pretty big bump in uh, pay in that sector, although that pay is still very low. Um, mo most recently, again, on a national level, the average annualized pay for someone who is a non-supervisory position in that um, sector was $20,628 which for a family four is below the poverty level. Um, and for an individual, you know, still qualifies you for a lot of different types of assistance. And that's actually after an annualized increase of about 18%. Now that increase has been helpful in attracting new workers as, we, as we're seeing, you know, the wages went up. And so, you know, that's exactly what you, what you, you think we would do. It attracted more workers. Um, but in honesty, that actually just got us back to where wages started because the sector took such a hard hit last year uh, during shutdowns and while everyone was staying home and, and not going out eating in restaurants. Um, 
The other thing to realize though, is that wage growth is not yet spilling into other sectors. And, and that's uh, important to mention because I think a lot of folks are saying, well, there's a concern that the economy is going to overheat and that inflation is gonna spiral. Um, but so far that kind of rapid wage growth is really just within this one sector. Um, again, as, as you might expect. Um, my last point there again, just to reiterate, um, is that the labor market is really just a market. You know, there are labor markets, there are consumer markets, and there are capital markets. Labor markets work like most markets do. Um, when you increase, when, when there's more demand, you increase your prices, and that's what's happening within um, the restaurant sector in particular. Um, my boss put out an op-ed recently um, with the sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek title, uh, this one weird trick will help employers get more workers. Um, and the one weird trick is raise your prices, raise your, raise your wages. Um, and, and fortunately for Kentucky and, and the rest of the state, the country, that, that is starting to work. Um, but we just were in such a deep hole, there's a long way to go. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. I think it's also important to mention that although hiring slowed down uh, on net in April, um, job entrance, so people entering back into the labor market actually picked up. Um, it was a very, there were a lot of folks who um, went back into the labor force that month. Um, but at the same time, uh, a slightly smaller number, but still a large number uh, left the labor force. And the difference between um, the people who left the labor force in March versus April uh, were entirely women. So a large number of women left the labor force between March and April. Um, and I, I'll be really upfront, that's interesting. <laughs> and, and there are not a lot of good explanations for it. We know that there is difficulty with childcare. We know that women tend to take on um, caring responsibilities, both for children, but also for loved ones like parents and uh, siblings and spouses. Um, so there is a degree to which uh, there is a, a, an exodus of women from the labor force compared to past months. Um, it's also uh, interesting to note that men made up for the entirety of the increase in labor entrance. Um, so there are just some really strange things happening in the labor market um, as it pertains to men and women. On top of what's already been a very strange downturn, um, folks may remember uh, from our last update that I showed a graphic that showed that um, for several months, um, there were more women applying for unemployment benefits than men, which uh, almost never happens. The last time that happened was uh, about 20 years ago, and it only happened for one or two weeks, let alone six months. Um, and that's just a reflection of the types of jobs that we lost during that time. Um, and so what we are going through right now is really, I think, some adjustment in our economy as folks are deciding what they want to do with their lives, um, what kinds of jobs they want, whether or not they want to go back into um, a, an industry with a lot of forward-facing, public-facing interactions while the pandemic is still existent, even if it's much smaller and, and, and more under control. Um, so there's a lot of uh, questions around um, how people want to continue their, their work life. So let's move into the next slide. Um, I should also mention too, as we uh, transition into an update on unemployment insurance, that um, while our uh, economy is slowly recovering, it's sort of emerging into uh, a recovery phase, um, federal relief has played an enormous role in ensuring that we don't experience further job loss um, or slide back into a recession. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to tell from this chart, but um, this sort of first bump that you see um, most recent to where we are now, that was when um, the, the December round of stimulus checks came out and when the extra $300 UI benefit um, resumed. Um, it had been $600, it was negotiated down to $300, so it started there. The second bump is when the second stimulus checks um, hit folks' banks, bank accounts. So. Um, consumer spending has, has recovered uh, in large part because of uh, this large influx of cash directly to individuals, which we hadn't seen so much of in past uh, recovery packages. Um, and really what I want us to keep in mind is, you know, we folks, I think, are pretty familiar with this idea of supply side economics, right? That if we 
you know, make things easier for employers, that that'll somehow trickle down to everyone else. But we forget that there's a demand side uh, of that, that same equation. And so folks are not going to be able to work uh, making and buying things. I'm sorry, making and selling things if someone else isn't buying it. So this extra cash really helped spur demand. And that demand really enabled uh, folks to go out and, and pay for everyday usual expenses, um, maybe, uh, you know, catch up on some, some things that they needed to do, whether that's like uh, home repairs that had, they had been putting off or car repairs, or maybe purchasing a new car that they had been waiting on. Um, and that's really enabled other people to, to get and keep their jobs. Um, one really interesting indicator that I've pointed to in the past is that the Economic Policy Institute did a, a study last summer looking at the $600 benefit and found that um, Kentucky's uh, employment will, will have slowed down by five, or sorry, 50,000 jobs um, over the course of a year because that extra money wasn't in our economy. Now, that's probably changed now because of the $300 benefit, but I think it is a helpful indicator to show that this federal money doesn't just help people keep their lights on and pay their bills, it actually keeps other people in their jobs. So let's go on and transition to unemployment insurance more broadly. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, just generally speaking, I think it's helpful for us to keep getting these snapshots of where unemployment insurance claims are. I mean, folks will remember that um, last April, um, so a little over a year ago, we had this just cataclysmic tsunami of claims. We had something like 800,000 people file for claims in the course of a few weeks, um, which is just unheard of out of a, a labor force of 2 million. Um, so uh, we've come a long way since then. And in fact, last week was the uh, lowest number of claims that we've experienced since before the pandemic. I think the last time we were below 3,000 claims was March 14th, 2020. Um, and so in some ways, we've hit a milestone. Now, I don't know that it's going to stay there, um, but I think it is important to point out and sort of celebrate the fact that we are getting to a place where fewer people feel the need to, to go to unemployment and, and draw on a, on a claim. Um, what we've also seen is that pandemic unemployment assistance claims are pretty low, um, about as low as they've ever been. Again, this is the program for um, gig workers, independent contractors, small business owners, folks directly uh, impacted by COVID either because they have it or because they're caring for someone who has it. Um, so it's that special federal program that was created through the CARES Act. And then claims for pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, which is um, basically extended unemployment, anyone who's run out of their, their usual number of weeks that they're allowed to get. Um, that's also much lower than it's been in recent weeks. In fact, it's fallen by about 10,000 claims over the last, uh, I think, three weeks. So you know, think numbers are generally trending in the right direction and they're doing so on their own. Um, and they're doing so with the help of um, federal relief spurring demand so that folks can, can get back into the jobs that are in their given field that are commensurate with their experience. Um, and I also think that it reflects to a degree a decision on the part of the administration to um, resume what are called work search criteria, which basically means you have to prove that you are out there looking for a job and that you accept a job that is um, suitable again to your experience and, and your skills, um, which you know I, I think is I have mixed feelings about, but um, but it is a reality that we're in right now. So let's move on to the next slide. So um, I want to take a step back because I think part of this labor shortage argument that, that folks are making is that, um, and, and indeed most of the states surrounding Kentucky and most states that are run by Republican governors, um, is that this extra $300 a week is really what's holding back the labor market. That because we're providing folks with a little bit of extra money to, to just essentially be kept whole while they're you know, getting back on their feet, while they're recovering from COVID, while their employer is getting back up and running, that somehow this is what is driving a, um, a, a, a sort of mediocre increase in jobs. Um, the fact of the matter is, first of all, it, it is not as much as what we had been giving. So this bar chart shows um, really the tail end of the first round of the, the what's called Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation or FPUC. Um, that was the $600 a week benefit the next sort of color bars is the, what's called the Lost Wages Assistance Program. That was the pro program that President Trump 
um, implemented through using FEMA money um, when the first round ran out. And then we really had this long gap um, with no benefits um, additional to, to what people normally get through UI or PUA. Um, and then uh, after um, the what's called the CRISA, the December relief package, and then what was extended through the American Rescue Plan, we had this $300 a week benefit. And that's really been uh, lower than we saw with either the Lost Wages Assistance Program or the first round of the $600 uh, per week benefit. But it still made a really big difference in our economy. It's represented about $360 million in Kentucky. And from the beginning of all of this, um, FPUC has brought in over $4 billion, um, which is a huge deal considering uh, how, you know, how many folks are out of work. Um, thinking about what that represents in terms of the number of folks who might have gone out of work had we not had that uh, money to spend on, on our day-to-day -day, um, needs it is really frightening. I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful that um, our governor and that um, you know, both this administration, this federal administration and the last chose to make this a priority. And it's also important again to remember that this money doesn't just sit in people's bank accounts. It, it, you know, it doesn't just disappear when they spend it. That money circulates through the economy. So when you spend that money on something, um, that goes into somebody else's pocket and then they use that to keep their lights on. So it's something called the multiplier effect. I like to think of it as like ripples in a pond. When you drop it in, it just tends to extend out and reverberate throughout the economy. Um, and actually generates more economic activity than its original value. So it, it has become a very important component of our ability to recover in a robust way. Um, and getting rid of it now would be uh, like letting off the gas just as we're accelerating. Um, so we need to continue to allow this to, to run its course. At the moment, it will expire on September 6th. And I don't think that that is um, by any means too late. Uh, I think it should continue. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. I also want to just point out that um, this $300 a week benefit, you know, that again, the argument being that um, for, uh, for some, this has become a disincentive to work. Um, if you think about that, um, the folks who uh, would be disincentivized from working would be the folks who are earning the least. Because if you already have a little bit in the bank account, or if you, if you have a potential for earning even more than what the $300 benefit plus whatever it is you're receiving in PUA or, uh, or UI, um, then, then you know, those are the folks who would want to um, hang on to that, that money and, and maybe not work. But the reality is, first of all, that multiple empirical studies have shown, and when you get the slides, there's three different links here if you want to go read them, um, have shown that the $300 benefit isn't really a factor in the labor force in general in terms of the folks who are receiving it and their decisions to enter the workforce or not. Um, but instead, what we're seeing is that the lowest wage sectors are the ones with the fastest job growth. And it's higher and middle wage sectors that are sort of middling in terms of their job growth. So the exact opposite of what folks are saying, especially around restaurants saying, you know, well, this is really holding back our ability to hire more people. Uh, it's, it's the exact opposite. It's exactly that industry that's hiring the fastest. Um, so the $300 benefit is really not, um, you know, playing much of a factor. In fact, the two sectors with the highest number of unemployment insurance claims right now are manufacturing and construction, which tend to be higher wage jobs. Um, so I think as you hear this argument, as, as you continue to hear folks um, uh, saying, we, well, we need to cut these benefits like unemployment insurance, and I'm sure in the future we'll hear arguments like we need to cut SNAP, we need to cut Medicaid, we need to cut all these other things as uh, a way of pushing people into jobs. Um, just know that 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 is a that is a faulty argument, and that we are actually um, using our fiscal toolbox the way we should in order to keep people whole and move the economy forward. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to hand it off to Jessica Klein. Thanks, Dustin. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Klein, and I'm a policy associate at the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy. Um, based on what you just heard from Dustin, we know that um, this mass amount of job losses is going to result in food insecurity. So I'm going to talk about the two programs that are most responsive to that, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and then Pandemic EBT. So starting with SNAP, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, 
again, the responsiveness of this program. We've seen an increase of over 140,000 additional Kentuckians receiving this grocery money through SNAP since February 2020. So that's about 622,000 Kentuckians that get grocery money through this program. And to Justin's point, um, you know, when people spend that money in their local economies, that brings additional money that goes through those economies. So um, it generates as much as a dollar and 80 cents for every dollar that the SNAP program uses. That's great to hear. Um, next slide. So for individuals on SNAP, we just started the recertification renewals um, as of April. Those were on pause throughout the pandemic, but people are now expected to recertify for SNAP. Um, so we just wanted to send a reminder that you will lose benefits if you don't recertify. So um, people can expect to get a notice about that recertification date. Um, they are then required to complete an interview, but you can do that over the phone now. Um, you can also submit documentation in a variety of ways like mailing it in, faxing it, or dropping it off at an office. Um, but I also want to mention that stimulus payments, some of the UI payments that Dustin talked about, child care tax credits, all of those do not disqualify you. And so if you are not sure about um, which benefits you're receiving might count against SNAP, you can call the DCBS office at 855-306-8959. Um, a few additional things within the SNAP program that have changed recently. Um, emergency SNAP benefits, they're also called max allotment, emergency allotment. Those benefits um, were approved every month by the USDA for those benefits, and we were just approved for June 2021. So people should be seeing those benefits. Um, there is a set of folks that are newly eligible for that program, um, and those are people who have not been seeing this throughout the pandemic, but they actually are those um, who have the lowest incomes, they'll begin to see that amount of money increase with max allotments, um, but there has been a delay on those payments. So those should be coming soon. Um, thank you. Uh, so PEBT, want to move on to pandemic EBT. Um, these are the benefits that make up for missed school meals uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, the current round of pandemic EBT covers October, 2020 through now, May 2021, um, and it's still going out. So you can see the, the May allotment is coming out in June. Um, so that should be coming out soon. And early analysis of PEBT says that throughout the, the crisis of COVID-19, we've seen, seen this decrease um, food hardship for children by 30% the week following disbursement. So I know there's been, um, you know, the timeline has changed several times throughout this, but it's definitely helping. So it's good to see um, more benefits going out in June, but there are even more coming soon. So um, for children one through six, um, we have a plan that's being approved by the USDA for that group. And again, it's going to cover that October 2020 period through now for kids one through six that participate in the SNAP program and whose daycare was closed during the pandemic. Um, so since that plan hasn't been approved, we don't have details, but that is the eligibility criteria for participating. So we'll have more information on that soon once it's um, approved by the USDA. And then for the larger group of people who've been participating in PEBT throughout the school year, summer PEBT was just approved which means those students will also see $375 this summer coming out. Um, and that's those that participate in the National School Lunch Program and have been receiving PBT throughout the school year. So more details on that. But um, there is more information in an article I recently wrote, so I'm going to put that in the chat for everybody also for a few, couple additional details on the summary PBT program. Next slide. Reconsideration. Reconsideration is the process for PEBT that the state uses to review benefit amounts for people who think they received fewer benefits that they were eligible for. So if you think um, you've received fewer benefits than you're eligible for, you can go through this process with the state to review the days that you were eligible and potentially get additional benefits. So what you need to do in order to do the reconsideration process is to call this number at DCBS. You need your student's full name, their date of birth, and their state student ID number. You can get that at your school's office um, or your school's district office. 
Um, and for people who've been approved through this reconsideration process, they've been issued benefits on a different schedule than everybody else because they're going through this process of making sure they're getting all the benefits that they're eligible for. So that's the new schedule you can see on the slide. Um, a few ad additional numbers to call. If you wanna check the balance on your PEBT card, um, they're white, but there's also some that have been going out and they're green. They come in the mail. Um, you can call the, the card number. It's 888-979-9949 to get the balance of your card or to get a new card if you lost yours. Um, and then for any other questions related to the pandemic EBT program or reconsideration, you would call that DCBS number um, or the, the email address here for that information. Next slide. And then for handouts, social media content, other communications um, for groups that you're working with that might be interested in learning more about PBT, you can find that at Feeding Kentucky's website. We have a bunch of resources there and we'll keep updating those as um, we learn more about the summer PBT coming out soon. So thank you. Hi, I'm Priscilla Easterling from Kentucky Voices for Health, and I'm going to be covering the marketplace subsidies and Medicaid updates. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, the public health state of emergency was extended through the end of uh, through July 19th. We do still expect this to be extended through the end of the year through end of 2021, but it's being done in 90 day increments. So currently all co-pays through Medicaid are still, subs are still suspended and luckily SB 55, which did pass the session, should go into effect at the end of this month, the beginning of July, and that will prohibit any co-pays in Medicaid or KCHIP moving forward. That's ex excellent news. Um, a couple of just reminders. COVID-19 tests should be free, but balance billing is still common. So if you have had any, if you have received any bills, check out the KEJC blog that's linked below and complete that form. There should be no out-of-pocket costs though for COVID-19 vaccines, whether you're insured or not. If you're insured, they can ask for your insurance card, they can bill your insurance, but you will pay nothing out of pocket. And if you're uninsured, then the, the, the cabinet takes care of that, the state takes care of that. And definitely feel free to check out that vaccine appointment checklist, which gives a little bit more information about how to find the vaccination site closest to you and what sort of ID that you need to bring with you. Next slide. Thanks, Kelly. So the biggest change for prior authorization this month is that beginning June 1st, Medicaid fee-for-service and NCOs can require prior authorization for any inpatient admission, with the exception of individuals with COVID. It was already in effect for outpatient Medicaid services, so this is just adding inpatient as well. But all prior authorization for Medicaid covered substance use disorders or behavioral health services and any um, med, uh, MAT products are still suspended. Um, yeah, so that's the biggest change. Everything else is gonna be continuing. Next slide. So just a reminder, PE is still a thing. So if you are uninsured, if you haven't used any PE periods, definitely go apply. It is worth it. It is definitely worth your time. Uh, a couple of things to know though, um, beginning since January 30th, DMS has been denying any new applications who are above that income eligibility threshold, which is 138% of the federal poverty line. If you're over, if you're 65 or older, or if you already have another form of health coverage. So if you don't, if you don't have any coverage, you're under 65 and you're under, you're at or below 138%, check out PE, please apply for it. Um, currently, there are over 140,000 Kentuckians who are currently covered by PE, and the PE application will thankfully remain publicly available on the cabinet's website. It's linked there, and Kentucky does allow two PE periods within the calendar year, which brings us to the next slide. <clears throat> There are some Kentuckians who are in this really specific uh, boat who were already enrolled in PE in December. They were auto enrolled in a new PE period that began January 1st and ended March 31st. And they were auto enrolled in their second PE period for the year, which goes from April 1st through the end of this month. So June 30th, there are a, a chunk of people 
who will be who will have used their second PE period for the entire year, which means um, that if you do absolutely nothing, you could be uninsured. However, just do something. So Medicaid and Medicaid is available. Fill out that full application. PE is managed by United Healthcare. They are doing affirmative outreach to all of their members, letting them know, please apply for Medicaid. And again, if your situation has changed, thankfully, there's still Marketplace SEP right now. So if Medicaid doesn't work, you can still go through the Marketplace and you can make sure you have coverage with no gap in coverage. Next slide. Thank you. So just to, a summary, um, there for 2021, again, any Medicaid enrollees who don't select an MCO are automatically enrolled in United Healthcare for 2021. Any Kentuckians who are under 65 or have their income at or below that 138% of the federal poverty line, please apply for Medicaid year round. You don't have to worry, you don't have to wait for an open enrollment period or special enrollment period, just apply. For PE, Again, it's managed by United Healthcare. There are, there are a group of Kentuckians who already had PE, Medicaid in December. They were auto-enrolled for uh, in United Healthcare from January 1st through the end of March 31st, and then automatically moved into another PE period that ends at the end of this month. So if you have any clients or friends or family who you know could be in this boat, might be in this boat, definitely encourage them to check out a Medicaid application. You can do that on Connect or you can go through the marketplace. Next slide. Okay, so nothing major has changed for the marketplace, healthcare.gov. I sort of use them interchangeably, so most people, um, but the special enrollment period goes through the end of August 15th right now. Four out of five enrollees can find a plan for $10 or less after tax credit. So like, it's a great deal. Um, you can find a lot of a really great affordable options on the marketplace if, if Medicaid, if your income is gonna be above Medicaid. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you fill out the application on the marketplace, you'll get an instant eligibility termination, and then you have about 30 days to choose a plan after you submit your application. So for example, if you went ahead and did an application today, today, right now, right after this webinar, you, your coverage would be set up and ready to go July 1st. So that way you don't have to worry about any gap in coverage. You can um, be enrolled and taken care of. All right. Um, so if you are a current enrollee, you can still take advantage of the special enrollment period and change any plan um, in your area without restriction. The only thing that I would caution you about is to check your deductible. If you had a high deductible plan or if you paid a lot in your deductible, you could possibly lose that if you move out of that plan category. <clears throat> so just be mindful of that. And if you have any questions, definitely reach out to a connector or uh, myself, anyone, and ask them because they will know and they'll help you. Um, and any new consumers, and honestly, even Kentuckians who are already enrolled, please, if you are uninsured, please go check out the marketplace. There are lots of great subsidies that were increased through the American Rescue Plan, and so things are a lot more affordable than they were in the past. Next slide. For example, did you know that new marketplace enrollees have saved an average of 25% while current enrollees have saved 40% nationwide? Thanks just because of those increased subsidies from the American Rescue Plan. So here's a table of comparing the different income levels and what you would have paid before the, before the American Rescue Plan and after. So please, it's definitely worth checking out. If you're uninsured, definitely check it out. Next slide. And yes, I agree with Dustin. If you have a short-term limited duration health plan, please go get any other health plan. Um, <laughs> through the marketplace, through Medicaid, um, there are lots of problems and I will not go into a whole aside about short-term long duration plans, but if you think you have one, reach out to a connector and check out Medicaid and the marketplace. Highly encourage it. So most of the American Rescue Plan health provisions went into effect on April 1st. So those increased ACA subsidies for the marketplace, um, 
the vastly reduced monthly premiums for people with low to moderate income, and it removed that upper limit for um, that 400% for the uh, for subsidies. So it's now based on a flat 8.5% income cap. <clears throat> so if your income is at 150% of the federal poverty line for an individual, that's about 19,000. For a family, that's about 39,000. For a family of four, you would qualify for a $0 monthly premium for a benchmark plan. That is free for a silver plan that will cover things and have minimal co-pays. It is worth it. It's not a joke. Um, and beginning, thankfully, beginning July 2021, 20, next month, there should be, um, there is a new opportunity that'll be on the marketplace for Kentuckians who received at least one week of unemployment benefits during 2021. So if you got it back in January, if you got it next last month, it doesn't matter. One week of unemployment benefits you will qualify for a silver plan at $0 monthly premium. So you still, again, you'll have to pay out-of-pocket costs for your co-pays and co-insurance, but the monthly premium is $0. There, yeah, that's free. So definitely check it out. And if you have any questions, please contact a local con connector or you can go through the marketplace, but I always like to keep things local and connectors are great. I love them, I'm one of them. Next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. So one more little opportunity that I threw in there is COBRA subsidies under the American Rescue Plan. So for those of you who don't know, COBRA is a special provision that allows people who were enrolled in their job health coverage who suffered an, um, who suffered an involuntary termination or reduction of hours that, that led to that loss of coverage. One of the major provisions in the American Rescue Plan mandates that employers have to provide a 100% COBRA premium for eligible employees. <clears throat> Excuse me, from April 1st through September 30th, 2021. So this is fantastic for most people. A lot of people like their job coverage, but then lose it and have the opportunity for COBRA, but do not elect to take it because then you have to pay the full premium. And for most people, that's just totally unaffordable because they can charge you up to 102%. But with the American Rescue Plan, there's this great provision. You don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Um, your monthly premium is 100% covered through the end of September. So if you had any qualifying event like that involuntary termination or reduction of hours and your eligible and your eligibility period goes which go, runs between April 1st and September 30th you were eligible for this employers and plan administrators had a deadline yesterday to send out anyone who could have been eligible before April 1st and now if you've had if you've lost coverage recently or anything like that definitely go talk to your plan administrator or your employer if you'd like to keep your cobra because this is a great opportunity as well. And upside, if you do choose to elect in COBRA, when that subsidy ends at the end of September, you would still be eligible for a marketplace SCP. So you wouldn't have to worry about not being able to get covered or having to take a short-term plan or anything like that because it's outside of open enrollment. That's not a problem. So that's also a really great opportunity if that's something you're interested in. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and the good old ACA lawsuit. So we are still waiting. We expect to hear an answer to decision by the end of the month. So we're more sort of nervously waiting at this point. But never fear because, again, Congress could fix this with just changing the fee to $1. Um, they can fix it. Just, you know, call your legislators. So that should be it. And if you have any questions, I'll be in the chat. I will pass it to you, Dr. Schuster. Thanks. Thank you so much, Priscilla. That's uh, wonderful news with all of these coverage options. And um, somebody put in the chat that being underinsured is almost as big a problem as being uninsured. So again, we encourage you to reach out to a connector to check out uh, healthcare.gov and see if you can do better. So uh, you've heard from either me or from my colleague, Marcy Timmerman, about mental health, behavioral health issues uh, across this pandemic time. 
and we've talked about there really being twin pandemics of the COVID and then racial injustice and certainly national political unrest. So I think the message is that we have all suffered in one way or, or another. Um, and it may manifest itself in various ways, depending on your makeup, uh, that of your children, your loved ones, uh, friends and neighbors. But we know that it's had a detrimental effect on both mental and physical health because we, our bodies react to stress. We have difficulty sleeping or we sleep all the time. We have headaches, we have back aches, uh, we eat all the time or we don't feel like eating at all. All of these kinds of things um, are reactions to stress, which um, stress really keeps you in a, in a uh, persistent alert state. And if you think about that, 15 months is a long time to be on high alert. And so I think we're all feeling um, fairly worn down at this point. Uh, we've seen depression, we've seen anxiety, we've seen increased alcohol and substance use. We've seen, unfortunately, uh, increased domestic violence, uh, child abuse, and sadly, even suicide. So now we're at a really strange time. And I really have been thinking about talking with my uh, mental health colleagues, uh, listening to, to uh, some CE presentations on this, because we're at a time when maybe we should be feeling great. Maybe we should be feeling elated that there seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel of the COVID lockdown, but with it comes incredible anxiety. I think most people at this point in time are still relatively unsure about how they're supposed to act. <laughs> are they safe? Are you safe? Are your kids who cannot be vaccinated yet? What do you do about them? What's a return to normal look like or feel like? Do we even know what normal is? Do we want to go back to the way things that were? Uh, and then you start wondering about why don't I feel better about where we are? And you see it, um, people are unsure about whether they need to wear a mask, want to keep wearing a mask, want to only be with other people that wear a mask. It is really still an incredible time of anxiety. And I think that we need to keep working on our mental health through this period of time. Um, I think we're going to have still these tremendous st stresses and a great deal of unknowns as we have for the past 15 months. And I think for the years to come, for those of you who have been particularly caught up uh, and all of us have at some level in the racial injustice, uh, there might not be the nightly uh, in Louisville, the nightly uh, marches and, and calls for justice. But people are dissatisfied with what's happened or not happened. People don't feel like justice has been served. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary, not celebrating, but recognizing the 100th anniversary of uh, terrible um, acts of violence against black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that most of us never knew existed which really has to make you uh, anxious about what other dark uh, secrets are out there in American history. So it's a very tense time. Um, and I encourage you to do a couple of things. Think about what helped you cope in the last 15 months. And those coping skills may need to change. Some of the things that you did because you didn't have to go out or didn't want to go out might might need to shift at this point as uh, as the demands shift. So think about your own self care. Um, be talking about um, your own kind of baseline. What caused you stress in the past, and how are those things different? And talk about it. Talk about it with people that you trust. That think about things the way that you do. Reach out and talk to a mental health professional if you're feeling particularly. Um, anxious or depressed at this time because there's a great deal of, of unknown. Um, keep in touch with your own feelings and those of, of the people around you because remember when you're in a, uh, a living unit or in a family unit or whatever kind of living situation that you're in, the feeling level of those around you has a tremendous effect on you. And for those of you who are women uh, who are listening to this, we carry a great deal of the uh, burdened and uh, care uh, to take care of everybody else's feelings and everybody else's uh, well-being. 
And we cannot do that unless we take care of ourselves. Remember the old uh, airline thing? You remember back when you flew on airlines and they would say if the uh, oxygen mask drops down and you're traveling with a, a youngster or someone who can't put it on, put your own on first so that you have the wherewithal to be able to put it on to that young person or that uh, disabled or, or elderly person who's not able to put it on. So we have to um, work on our own self-care, um, certainly. Um, protect yourself. If there are people that are handling this new quote, return to normal in ways that make you feel unsafe, then limit your time with them if at all possible. Uh, if you need to be in conversation with them, limit your conversation to the things that you can agree upon and uh, tread lightly on those things that, that bring you great angst. Um, and again, uh, give yourself permission to take care of yourself. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is great work from Mental Health uh, First Aid, which Marcy Timmerman at Mental Health America of Kentucky teaches. If you're interested in getting uh, more of this information, you could contact her at mhaky.org. Uh, but um, look for opportunities to laugh, uh, get enough sleep. I find that I don't have anyone at home except my little yappy dog to tell me to go to bed. <laughs> and so I end up staying up way too late and then I'm uh, not in good shape the next day. So know, know that about yourself. and and take care of yourself in terms of sleep, in terms of exercise. Again, setting healthy boundaries is something that um, is both self-protective and sometimes protective of those around you. Be kind to yourself. Um, we are awfully hard on ourselves. We are our own worst critics sometimes. And I think to acknowledge that these are difficult, stressful times and that you're doing the best you can. And if you, uh, make a misstep or you make somebody unhappy or you find yourself uh, needing to shut down, be kind to yourself about that. Take care of yourself and then uh, work to get back a little step at a time back to where you're more comfortable being. And stay connected to loved ones. I think for some of us, this time has given us a period of reflection. I've actually written letters in longhand, which I haven't <laughs> given myself the time to do it a long time and people seem to enjoy that. Um, Penny puts a good point in, it means stepping away sometimes from the incessant Zooms and trainings. And some of those will bring up trauma issues that are, that are very difficult. So again, you have to take care of yourself before you could care for others. And uh, again, I would just remind the women in the group that uh, we tend to not do that. We tend to do it the other way around which uh, drains all of our energies for ourselves. Next, please. These are great uh, crisis lines. Um, we do know that there are more calls to the crisis centers um, and those are the 1-800-273-TALK. Uh, for those in the LGBTQ community, uh, the Trevor uh, text lines, chat lines and, and call lines are, are very helpful. There's a special, um, uh, I think if you press one on the suicide prevention lifeline, it's for vets, uh, veterans. And we heard a lot of that yesterday from uh, about those who gave the ultimate sacrifice and for their families. And then we know that veterans and their families uh, sometimes need to talk to people that really understand what they're going through. Um, I will remind you that even though your local community mental health center may only be open partially or limited hours. They still have uh, lots of telehealth uh, available and uh, people are finding this a, a great way to access behavioral health services uh, without needing to travel, without needing to kind of work it into uh, your daily routine. So re reach out to an agency, to an organization, to a, a professional in your community and again, the coverage uh, that you get with uh, Medicaid or any of the other uh, insurance plans should help you take care of uh, the cost for doing that. And then the next slide, please. So I wanna alert you to an issue that we've been dealing with since the first of the year. Um, 
one of the things that we worry about uh, when talking about people with uh, a mental health condition, particularly, and those trying to uh, get sober uh, from substance use disorders, is that they have access to the appropriate medication when they need it uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, the Kentucky Department for Medicaid Services launched a uh, what we call a single formulary or single listing of prescribed medications. We quite frankly have been asking for this for a number of years because uh, previously each of the managed care organizations, each of the MCOs had their own formulary or list. And it was very, very difficult for prescribers to know when they saw you in their office or uh, wherever they were seeing you for treatment, um, which MCO you had, what their formulary was and, and so forth. But we've had, unfortunately, a number of problems in getting this single formulary to result in what we want it to result in, which is Medicaid members getting their prescriptions uh, on time, either filled for the first time or refilled at the pharmacy. So I will tell you that your prescribers, whether that's a doctor or a nurse practitioner, or if you're seeing a dentist for dental work and you need a prescription, all of those prescribers are working hard to make sure that you get the right medication for your treatment, particularly if it's mental health and addiction illnesses. So I've put my email address uh, on there. It's kyadvocacy at gmail.com. If you are a family member or someone you know has uh, had trouble accessing their Medicaid uh, member and they're having trouble getting the medications that they're supposed to be getting, please email me so I can put you in touch with the people that can help. We have alerted Medicaid. Uh, we have the pharmacy um, director kind of on hold <laughs> for any information that we can give. Uh, also, some of the Medicaid staff have been very helpful. And we wanna be sure that you get the medications that you need so that you can uh, get well, uh, handle your illness, get into recovery. So please do not hesitate to reach out to me and let me know if you're having any problems with access to medications. And I wish you all good health. So I'll turn it over to Adrian, who will tell us about evictions and housing. It's all yours, Adrian. Thanks, Dr. Schuster. All right, next slide. By the way, I am Adrian Bush. I'm with the Homeless and Housing Coalition of Kentucky and probably should have said that for those of you who are new to the Thrive Kentucky webinar series. But regardless, here we are. Um, for one more month, we do have eviction orders in place um, through both the Centers for Disease Control, as well as Governor Bashir's executive order, which prevents removal until at least June 30th. Um, in, during this month, Kentucky Equal Justice Center, which created this um, homerunnerdeclaration.org app this app is still good, so we're still encouraging folks to use it um, for issues with non-payment of rent. Um, that is what the CDC's order and the governor's executive order um, covers. Other issues like non-renewal of lease, other lease violations are not covered by this order. Next slide. Okay, so each month we've been looking at the 211 call center data. Um, this 211 project actually looks at three different uh, United Ways in Kentucky. Um, and we have chosen to kind of look at Metro United Way. Um, and what we're finding is that consistently, you know, um, between a quarter and a third of calls overall are for housing and shelter. And then of the housing and shelter requests, um, there is still a high need for rent assistance. In Louisville in particular, um, the money that has been used for rent assistance came from the December relief, COVID relief package. Um, and so they're negotiating with the state to get additional money to cover Louisville um, out of that relief package. But in the meantime, it's incredibly painful for people who are behind on their rent. Next slide. The other thing I like about this tracker is that it shows um, where 
these requests for assistance are coming from um, in Jefferson County and Metro United Way's um, service area. And then it also compares requests, you know, it, from the last year and the year before that. So next slide. If you need rental assistance, um, honestly, the best way to get it is just to show up co in court if you get an eviction notice, which is not the most trauma informed way to get rental assistance. But again, this is where we are in Lexington. There is a portal through um, Lexington Fayette Urban County Government's website. Um, and they are still taking applications. They have applied for additional money from the state as well. And if you are in one of the other 118 counties in Kentucky, you will go to teamkyhherf.ky.gov or the Healthy at Home Eviction Relief Fund. Next slide. Okay. So Kara talked about what was um, what bills are being considered, what has passed. We just wanted to cover briefly what's new in the American Rescue Plan Act for Kentucky. Um, and we know that we will be getting an additional tranche of emergency rental assistance um, that is supposed to be a little bit more flexible, requires jurisdictions if the landlord won't accept the money to get the money to the tenants, um, which is something that is sorely needed. It also provides for relocation, which is very much needed as well. With the Homeowners Assistance Fund, um, there is at least $85 million coming to Kentucky. The minimum that every state was getting was around 50. So we're excited that we're getting a little bit more. The income limit can go up to 150% of the area median income. And then in the homeless assistance realm, new since last month is that about 500 additional Section 8 emergency housing choice vouchers to both urban and rural public housing authorities have been issued. Um, so in Lexington, they had some a press conference last week um, sharing how they plan to use these vouchers to really get every family with children who's currently in the system a voucher, a place to live. So that is very, very exciting. Next slide. Okay, um, this slide goes into the different, the the new information that we have from the Department of Treasury around the emergency housing vouchers, as well as emergency rental assistance. And um, I will type that in the chat because at this point, the money has been allocated um, for the homeowner assistance program, but it's they're still in the process of setting it up. So next slide. Okay, and Kara also talked about the American Jobs Plan. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that we have, um, there is currently a national campaign being pushed by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And that the American Jobs Plan currently includes two of the three housed campaigns top priorities for an infrastructure bill. One is about 45 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund. This is construction money basically, um, but targeted to people at or below 30% of the area median income. So extremely um, poor folks. And then another is to, uh, about $40 billion to tackle the major backlog in public housing. Part of the reason we even have a housing crisis, sometimes it's helpful to step back and ask like, why are we in this situation? Um, and part of it is because we've consistently disinvested in public housing for the last 50 years and you get what you pay for. So, um, but the big thing that's missing is just universal housing vouchers. We strongly feel that this is one way that um, we can tackle the affordability crisis that existed prior to COVID-19. And that is, you know, changing things instead of housing choice vouchers being a lottery that you have to be really lucky to get, um, making it an entitlement uh, like Medicaid or SNAP. Next slide. 
We are continuing our story collection um, in partnership with Kentucky Voices for Health. So be sure to, if you're interested, um, talk to Katie Mueller, who is working with folks and um, sharing their stories. Next slide. Resources for advocates and consumers. And I'm not sure who is tackling this. I can, if anybody, but if somebody else wants to go for it. I think Kelly is going to do it, Adrian. Perfect, Kelly. I don't know. I think you should wing it. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'll start to wrap us up here, and I do have my eye on the clock. <clears throat> and Adrian, there's a couple of questions in the chat for you. So, <clears throat> a lot of this is repeat information um, that we have shared with you before. We want to continue sharing with it, so you just have easy resources, links, toolkits, all of the goods available at your fingertips. Um, and the past month or so, you recall maybe seeing our ARPA explainer and FAQs doc. And these are really um, distilled down versions of the information that is otherwise really robust and complex. And we're trying to elevate. And this is, um, this is and was a collaboration with Thrive Kentucky campaign with the Cabinet for Health and Family Services to spotlight available resources now. There, there's confusion and there will continue to be some confusion over legislative authority um, in spending some of Kentucky's ARPA money but there are available resources that Kentuckians can access now. Um, and as of last week, and on each of the next few slides, uh, this is linked. It will also be linked in the follow-up materials uh, that you receive via email tomorrow, but they are available in Spanish. So the tinyurl.com forward slash ARPA for Kentuckians has now um, English and Spanish materials for both the two page front one page, front and back, explainer, um, and the FAQ, which is a lot more detailed. So just going through these really quickly, I won't go through everything. Stimulus checks, we've gone over that several times. Several of our presenters have uh, spoken to that and how impactful they have been and continue to be for Kentucky households. The child tax credits, um, as we heard from Kara earlier, Hopefully we will see the portals as well as some federal guidance uh, before our next monthly update. Um, maybe in July, we'll be able to really get into some of the nitty gritty of what that looks like, what families can expect. Um, and of course, this hinges on filing your taxes in the first place. Uh, the healthcare.gov subsidies and the special enrollment period, Priscilla has done a wonderful job <clears throat> really spotlighting and honing in on the benefits available to folks. So even if you're working with someone locally that is managing their health care plan, generally likes their health care plan, it is still worth it to check out and see if you qualify for a $10 or less package or even a $0 premium. It's um, one in a huge lifetime opportunity for folks to really get more affordable access to health care right now. Thank you to the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, Jessica went through the SNAP food assistance and the next slide is on PEBT. Um, they are expanded. We are still learning more about future PEBT plans and how it will affect uh, families, what they can expect. Um, if folks are not enrolled that you're working with and qualify, it's important that we get them enrolled as quickly as possible. Food insecurity is unfortunately still a huge problem in Kentucky. <clears throat> so there's PEBT, housing relief, we just heard from Adrian, um, not just the vouchers, although those are huge and impactful, but the full gamut of resources that the American Rescue Plan Act offers to Kentuckians and how important it is. Um, housing is essential to health um, overall. And if we can get some housing security, housing relief to those in need, it, it will be um, so huge. So moving away from the ARPA explainer and FAQ, here's just some general resources um, for rental assistance, homeless assistance, utility assistance. Here you'll notice on the other resources, we have added the IRS guidance for those experiencing houselessness right now <clears throat> that just came out last week. Legal aid 
is a feature uh, that is so important to those experiencing issues with Medicaid, other forms of health care, housing issues. Here's just a quick snapshot. You can easily print off and hand to somebody um, to get them the legal support that they need. Here are some food assistance resources, um, including our food policy network, which I believe has a statewide meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> uh, Dustin and others with the KY policy team continue to update and manage uh, these three trackers. And so this is for if you are if you or anyone you work with or know really wants to get into some of the nitty gritty numbers, data breakdown um, of these safety net programs, th this is for you. This is where you can really start to understand how the policy and numbers evolve into uh, benefits for Kentuckians. Uh, the story banking project that Adrian mentioned, this is a joint project, KVH and HHCK. Uh, there is Katie Mueller's email again. Uh, it doesn't have to be a good or bad specific story. We want to share experiences and it's the folks you are working with, the folks we work with, you never know how one sentence of your experience is going to impact um, or change someone else's life if they're going through something similar. And it's also, um, in addition to that, essential for us to elevate these stories to policymakers, um, showcase what barriers still exist, uh, why policy changes may still be needed, um, and it's important that we can paint that picture of here's what's actually happening. Here's a new perspective and experience for Kentuckians right now. Um, here are some save the dates. Uh, our next monthly program is on July the 6th. There's the link uh, to register. Our next quarterly format will be in August. I've uh, gone ahead and linked that so you can register for that one if you'd like. Um, here is the evergreen always in style advocacy 101 training with Dr. Schuster. Even if you've seen this before, we encourage you to rewatch it and you never know what you might pick up on the second or third pass. It's very helpful information. Again, for our licensed social workers and certified CHWs, just pop me an email or give me a call after today's program and we'll coordinate on getting you a continuing education certificate. Thank you again to our 2021 sponsors. Um, I don't know if any of them are still on the call, but we appreciate <clears throat> your engagement and support. If there are no additional questions, I just want to remind everyone that the final slide here, if there is anyone who presented today or not, but you would like to have a more detailed or specific conversation, um, if you have specific questions, here's how you can reach us um, any given time. So. With that, I will start to close it down. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, happy Pride Month, and we will see you in July.